Welcome to the third day of Shifting Design. I want to start by acknowledging where I'm calling in from today, the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, uh, also known as Nam or Melbourne. Um, I want to extend uh, my thanks for the custodianship that they have looked after the land for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, and I want to extend my thanks to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, Thank you all so much. This is amazing. I think we're on day three of Shifting Design. If this is your first panel, Shifting Design is the penultimate, penultimate? Inaugural, I forgot the word. Inaugural conference by deputy bringing design at tech companies together to dissect and reflect on what design actually means to us and how we can all work together to learn and grow and share the experiences that we've had while working in tech. So it's so lovely to, to have you here at the panel. Um, we're just over halfway. This morning, we had a really wonderful Instagram live hosted by uh, two fantastic designers in our team, Nina Troga and Rafi Ramirez, where they were speaking to Sophie Matrai and Tommy Mayers about inclusive brand design. Lots of very, very interesting considerations about how to make sure that your brand is reflecting your audience and also uh, going out to the people that you want to reach and bring into your product. Uh, and so we're hoping that we can follow up that incredibly like wonderful panel discussion with one of our own. Uh, and we're going to be talking about how to design for everyone. And uh, I'm really excited. Uh, if you need closed captions, they're available for this. We have a live captioning service from Captions Live. So Karma will be pumping out what we're saying into the chat and uh, will be available after the panel today. Uh, and if you have questions as we go through the panel today, please put them in the Q&A uh, and we will answer them as they come up. And if we don't get to them, we'll answer them after the session. I'm just so excited and uh, I'll do a really quick introduction and then I'll, I'll, I'll let the panelists introduce themselves. Um, with us today, we have Nancy Lee, who is the head of design and customer at T-Shirt Ventures, Mim Stebbing, who is the head of design at Rejig, Bianca Cassanidi, who is the design lead at Slip, and uh, one of my favorite people in the world, Divya Balakrishnan, who is uh, the person who leads our voice of customer research at Deputy and who has a very big affinity, uh, was it? A love of capybaras, which we share in an Instagram DM regularly. Uh, so I, I'd love to just do like a, a very, very quick intro, maybe talk uh, about yourself and a bit of the context about the company that you're working in before we jump into the questions. So I'll hand over to you, Bianca. First up, thank you. Thanks, Deputy, as well, for having me. Um, my name is Bianca. As um, Rowan said, design lead at Slip for about coming on to three years now. Um, for those of you who do not know, Slip is a smart receiving company. We send receipts direct to your banking app. All you need to do as a customer is just tap your card at checkout, and within a matter of seconds, you'll get this amazing interactive receipt that connects the customer experience in your bank app. Um, yeah, that's us. Beautiful, I'll pop over to Nancy now. Uh, yep, I'm Nancy. I look after um, design and customer at um, T-Shirt Ventures. So we're um, a health tech company. Basically the mission is um, to build solutions for users with um, disability and long-term needs. Um, and our, you know, our, the first thing we're trying to do is really make the national disability insurance scheme um, just simpler and a lot easier to navigate for our users. Wonderful, Divya. Hi everyone, my name is Vivia and as Rowan said, I'm the voice of customer researcher here at Deputy. We do workforce management, so we are that sort of glue that connects payroll, timesheet scheduling, everything that's needed to make a business of really any size operate really smoothly so people can do the parts of the job that they actually love. Um, yes, that's, that's my role here at Deputy. Beautiful, and Mim? Hey, I'm Mim. I'm head of experience design at Rejig. Um, and for those of who, sorry, those of you who don't know, uh, Rejig is uh, a HR SaaS company. Um, has a, a platform that uses ethical AI to create um, a more fair uh, workforce. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited. I think there's such a breadth of experience here uh, working in different fields and with different types of experiences. So I'm really excited for the conversation. Uh, the first question that we're going to launch into is, you know, inclusive design is such a big, 
big area and can touch many things. So what I'm really keen to hear for is maybe share like, what are you spending your time on right now to make design more inclusive at your organization? Uh, and I'll kick off with Mim. Thanks. Um, yeah, so we're doing heaps of things and it, it's a really exciting company to do that in because our whole product kind of supports that. So it's built into the culture um, in everything we do, but our team in particular, at the moment, we're focusing on building out a design system um, and we're using that design system to make sure that every atom in that system is following best practice and um, accessibility standards. Uh, but this is something as well, it's a little bit of a mindset um, that we're, we're spreading around the company, it's already in the company. Um, it, it's about making sure that we're pulling in feedback and being open to change in everything that we do. Beautiful, uh, Divya? So right now, when it comes to making our design practices more inclusive, it really goes beyond um, visual design, but really to other areas of the company. Uh, I'm running a global research program that we're calling Clocking In With Our Customers. And it's our first large scale voice of customer program that's advancing inclusivity by spotlighting our customers. Um, and their stories in short form videos. So it's really creating this library of um, educational content that's pulling from these in-person interviews. So I'm kind of bouncing around to all these different cities where we have hubs of customers and interviewing them. And the, really the portion about their experience with deputies is really small compared to their background and their stories and who they are as a person uh, or who they are as people. And so collecting all of this information and and putting it all sort of side by side so we can see all these stories comparatively and, and in relation to each other um, and turning it into basically this video library for everyone else at deputy so kind of like uh, the Netflix, I guess, for deputy, but you know all you get to see is different culture culture merge. that's a new word <laughs> cultures and customers stories. <laughs> um, so it, it's kind of creating a new form of education. Um, and just gathering a really wide range of perspectives across America, which is the region that we're focused on expanding in right now. Beautiful, thanks, Bianca. Yeah, we're, we're focusing on an approach similar to MIM. So we've got all of our kind of, our base, um, I guess, toolkits as accessible as possible. But then most recently, we're really branching out and we're having the conversation more broadly at SLIP because I think that diverse products come from diverse teams. And so we're really educating the company on, well, what is it? What is accessibility? How can we think differently? How can we see diversity as an opportunity to innovate and less of a guideline or, or bumper lanes to what we can and can't do? Um, and we're really lucky at SLIP. We've got a really compassionate team and we really do encourage that kind of open and honest conversation. We're good at calling out one another's biases. And so it's this whole kind of conversation that we're really focusing on first and foremost. And then from there, I guess the sky's the limit. Beautiful. I'm hearing again and again, the culture, the culture, you need a culture of this. So that's really awesome. And I'd, I'd love to hear Nancy, like the space that you work in, I feel like that culture and that, that connection is really necessary. Yeah, so yeah, it's really, really interesting. Um, echoing what Mim and Bianca are saying, um, because of the space that we're in and what you, you just said, like the culture already exists. So like our challenge really is then, or the opportunity for us really is then, okay, how do we execute upon that? So we're all like, you don't need to get that buy-in. We don't need to go, hey, this is the value of being more inclusive, more diverse, being accessible, but you need the knowledge, the skills, the, the, the coordination to be able to make that happen. And that's kind of, yeah, what we're doing right now. It's like, okay, how do we formalize this into a process that, that can then roll out into action. Yeah, absolutely. So, so uh, like, so important to, to really like spread that out. Um, I'd really love to know as well, like redesigning how we work and, and trying to like be really deliberate about creating that inclusive culture. Like it's a journey. Like it doesn't just one day wake up and everyone's like, oh my God, I'm so inclusive. Um, I'd really love to hear some stories from you about uh, some of those early deliberate decisions that you made when you were like, you know what, this is important. This is a thing that I'm going to do. Uh, and, and it had a real impact. And, you know, I'd love to, love to hear from Mim. First again, let me have a quick think. Um, some stories. 
I guess it, it's really built into everything. Like I said, the, it's about the mindset. So in terms of like creating a team. So my current um, challenge is, well, not challenge, opportunity. I like that better now. It's like you said, um, is building a team. So we're doing a lot of hiring at the moment in the design team um, and making sure that it's built into everything we do. So it's the questions we ask, making sure we're asking open-ended questions. Um, but no matter what you're doing, it's about making sure that you're sensitive and open to and being empathetic and listening to other people's situations and circumstances and creating room and flexibility to have them input into whatever the conversation might be or whatever it might be, whether if it's it's crafting where your meetings are in the week, you know, making sure that it's actually an open conversation and it's an evolution and we can continually grow. I don't know about you guys, but like I'm always worried that I'm going to say something wrong or I'm going to be insensitive about something. And I think that kind of comes along um, with our roles in, in design and, and what we're doing. And I think that's fantastic. But I think it's about not being worried and not being closed off and making sure that you're openly saying, hey, this is what we've done. How does that sit and pulling in all those insights and feedback from everywhere you can? Yeah, beautiful. So important. Um, I, I love this. Like it's it's everything, like the hiring process. It's, you've got to be thinking about all of these different areas. Uh, does anyone else have a, like some other examples of where they've made like these deliberate decisions to um, be more inclusive in their practice? Yeah, um, I can go if, uh, if that's cool. So one thing that I've been trying to do at my time in deputy since I joined was I usually have an assignment, some kind of research assignment that I'm working on, but and a target audience. I try to also find people who are outliers, so to speak, and make sure that we're still incorporating their their voices and their perspective into any research. Because if if we're just showcasing one perspective, it's going to start lending itself towards um, bias of some sort or just being too homogenous um, in a way that it's just not reflecting reality. So. The way that I do this is deliberately finding people who might be a little bit on the fringe of this target that we're looking for. Um, and apart from that, I'm also really intentional with the way that I speak to people. So every new interview that I have, you know, in essence, they're a stranger, they're a brand new person to me, and we have no idea of each other's backgrounds, history, story, any of it. So as a person of color myself, language has been something that's impacted me my whole life from the way that I pronounce my name to the way that people describe me to the way I describe myself. So in a world now where it's so easy for us to understand or be able to empathize with others, I think putting that extra effort to use language that can be um, more widely applicable, more inclusive can really make a huge difference in making people feel comfortable and at ease with you, which when you're doing research, whether it's design research or general research, making the person you're talking to feel comfortable is one of the most important things you can do because that's gonna yield um, deeper insight, more honest insight. And um, ultimately that's what we really want. So that's what I like to do. Love it, I love like intentional about language. Something that's so just, default oftentimes like this is how I'm talking this is how I explain things but like really thinking about how you can build that connection so important in research and also I would say so important in all the other aspects of how we design as well uh, Bianca were you were you about to jump in as well yeah but I was going to kind of flip it because I feel like since this one moment that I had a few years ago I've been more intentional but it really took this shock to to kind of realize that for the best part of my career up until this point, and this was, I think maybe 2016, I'd been designing really exclusively. And the kind of scenario was we were designing an augmented reality game for a, one of the big banks and there was no time for a design handoff. So I just handed over my design files. Best of luck to the creative technologist who had to build a demo overnight. And he came back and I was just puzzled because it looked nothing like the designs. And I, and I was really, naive at that point because I was like I don't understand it would have been so simple to just grab the color swatch like how did we land here and it was that day that I learned about tridinopia which is the blue yellow color deficiency and I think from that moment onwards it was it, it just made me kind of realize that the way I see things is unconstrained by any kind of limitations um and I just feel like that moment for me was when I was more conscious. It was that moment that made me more, I guess, aware 
And it starts there, right? It starts with this awareness and this appreciation and this acknowledgement of diversity in all of its capacities. I think as well, we tend to think of, I guess, you know, accessibility as this means to create access for people with disability, but I think it's just access more broadly. It's just, how do we make sure that everybody can interact, see, read, whatever it be with one product in, you know, however they need to do it. And I think that for me, it wasn't so much how, it was more the why. So huge aha moments almost like in, in these moments or all moments as well <laughs> in some, some of the cases I've had. Nancy, I, I'm keen to hear from you as well because you've got like the, the extra context of like quite a lot of empathy and knowledge within the organization. You know, are those aha moments still happening about like how you can do things better? Yeah, definitely. I, I find it actually like inclusivity quite interesting because I, I it's quite contextual. So depending on, it's like a ma majority and mar minority thing. So depending on, so I grew, grew up in Southwestern Sydney, which is largely like a immigrant community, um, at least where I grew up. And so when I kind of left the area to go to uni and all of that, I'm just like, oh, I went from feeling like I was a majority to part like a minority. And then when you hear discussions about um, you know, um, cultural like minorities. I, I never saw myself growing up as a minority. And similarly now in the space that I'm in, um, people who are traditionally, I guess, excluded from like mainstream products or whatever have become my main users. So uh, I guess my biggest mind shift coming here was that with in terms of like inclusivity, accessibility, majority, minority, it really, really shifts in terms of the context and the environment. And the shift could be just suburb to suburb or user group to user group, product to product. And so it kind of makes sense that if we think about everyone globally as just, hey, we're human, um, it just makes things a lot more easier. Um, so, so important. Like that's such a huge mind shift as well. Like the contextual nature of you know in groups out groups who's been disabled by the things that we've actually built that do, like don't help them exist uh, I, I love that idea as well and i heard a bit in, in divya's conversation as well making sure that you know there were people here that may not be in the segment but of course they're part of the segment and of course they have like these really rich contexts that you can bring into your design so yeah just so wonderful I'm, I'm absolutely loving this conversation. So good. Um, I, I'm going to do a, a slight shift here and um, uh, accessibility, right? A lot of the times when we talk about in inclusion, inclusive design, accessibility is that thing where we learn about it first or it's our introduction to the world of everything that exists. And um, I, I would love to hear from Bianca about the journey that Slip's been on from... I guess like the awakening into accessibility is important into the culture that you've built now around accessibility. Yeah, great question. I think I have to preface my response by saying that when I joined SLIP, nothing existed. Um, it was an early stage uh, startup, no design systems, patterns, lab, there's nothing. There's nothing to kind of work with. And that comes with this awesome opportunity, I guess, to create it all right and I guess because of how much I personally care for accessibility I made sure that was at the heart of it but then when we look at slip um, as a company we're in this really unique position where we didn't have to accrue I guess users we went live with one of the big four banks in Australia and overnight we went live to millions and so we, with that comes this social responsibility so this kind of intersection of opportunity and responsibility socially was where we really thrived I guess as a company in spearheading our product into this really accessible and inclusive space and so if we think about how we've led or how I've helped lead the company to get to this place it's through weaving um, I guess the making weaving it into our process as opposed to making it an afterthought. Like we don't just get to the end of a build and go, okay, where are we accessible? Tick cross, check the WCAG guidelines. It's not that. It's at the front. It's in the discovery phases. It's how we talk. It's how we research. Who we recruit when we research. Um, how we speak and how we connect to have these really authentic conversations with our our research participants. 
then it's also the building blocks to Mim's point at the start. Like if we get those right and we remember why we're building them in such a way, then it kind of keeps us motivated. Um, last year, we actually got, and we're super proud of this at Slip, but our core product is now accredited um, as AA compliant and in some cases AAA compliant. And that for us was just a moment we celebrated, but we didn't do it alone because the other thing at Slip is we really acknowledged our knowledge. And, and when we sort of realized that this whole concept of accessibility and inclusivity is just far beyond what we could ever master, we partnered with Vision Australia. And so we got them to come in and we got them to guide us and teach us. And I guess now we're at the point where we've got the foundations in place. We've got the kind of understanding of what we need to do and what our responsibility is socially, given the huge audience that we are going to continue to grow and, and speak to. And so it's about yeah, the journey from here, how do we maintain it and how do we get better? I mean, very, very easy segue. How do you maintain it and how do you get better, Bianca? Well, I guess it's through ensuring that we maintain a level of diversity in our conversations, in who we hire, uh, in who we speak to. And then back to that kind of point I said at the start, it's about breaking down those barriers and seeing them as not a challenge, but seeing them as a real opportunity. And I guess... It, you are kind of constrained because the business has, you know, its products that it needs to develop, but there's always, always opportunity within, you know, the realms of whatever you're creating. And I think it's just never losing focus on, on the goal of being a universal product. Yeah, wonderful. wonderful. Thank you so much for that, like, in-depth, like, analysis of, of the journey of accessibility. And I, I'm actually keen to hear uh, the other panellists' perspectives in their organisation with accessibility, you know, where it came from, where it's at and, and where's next. I'll jump in. I think we're in a really exciting space in like product design um, because I don't know about you guys, but when I'm using a product, I can really tell, I don't know if this is a design thing, but I can tell what the team's like and how they've made it and what they care about. And to me, that comes back to values and principles. And so, it makes me think that it's all about the company and the people building this, which is why I'm so passionate about the people and, and kind of making sure that we're designing our teams and our culture um, back to that. I'm sorry to bring it back to culture, but so it, making sure that it's built into our design principles and that we're really focused and um, considered in our approach to how we design things. And to your point, Bianca, like making sure that it's part of the process up front. So whether it's the research we're doing and making sure that we're talking to a diverse group of people when we're doing our research research or um, whether it's just making sure that those check boxes that we look at when we're, you know, wireframing or ideating in the beginning are kind of like passing all these, um, these checks. But also it's making sure that we're not just thinking of it as accessibility because it's so much more than that. Like for me, accessibility is a baseline, um, you know, like that it shouldn't be considered just making it usable for everyone because everyone is not just that line, it's inclusivity. So it's making sure that, um, you know, like parents who have kids on their hips can still open a door or use a product with one hand, or, you know, I'm left-handed and I struggle to use some things on my phone. Um, or, you know, people who have um, visual impairments is, that's like a, another baseline, but it might just be somebody who's a little bit older and their eyesight's going. So it doesn't necessarily need to be someone with a very common um, disability. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I love it. I love that you always bring it back to culture. So I'm like, of course, of course, everything leans back to culture, Mim. I yeah, love it. it does. Um, I mean, that's, sorry, one more thought. It's also like, in terms of the culture, it's psychological safety. So if you've got a team, a company that are all happy to feed back and buy in and give their thoughts, and that's something you can absorb and put into everything you do, then you're going to be in a better place. So true. And just a really quick sidebar to, to Nancy, because you said that like the context is really important with the products that you're building and the audience that you're working with. Like what's the approach to accessibility in, in um, T-shirt ventures? Um, yeah, so we're very much at the stage, which is why I really, really would love to pick your brain at some point, Bianca, where, you know, when I joined, um, we, we, you know, I, I mean, we still don't have a design system, we still don't have um, any of that functional stuff set up so that we can build more our products to be more accessible. Um, and so we're really at a stage where we're just formalizing, hey, what does that look like? What is 
what, what does that look like for us? So like for our company, for what we're trying to do, not just follow like the weekend guidelines or, or, or whatever, but like just have a, really, a good stand on what that looks like for us, both from a, you know, um, product um, perspective, but also from a cultural, from a, you know, voice and tone and approach um, perspective. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Um, another slight conversation on the similar topic. Um, something that a lot of people experience is this, this need to advocate and build not advocacy just from you telling people how important this is, but, you know, get those senior stakeholders doing that for you, you know, building those bridges into areas of the business that you don't have access to. Uh, does anyone have some success stories about how they manage to like, you know, build that with some of their key stakeholders and, and the impact that that has on the ability to get more accessibility, more inclusive design done? I can say a little bit about this because advocacy is very top of mind for me right now. Um, even with this program that I'm running, it's sort of in this phase where it's being executed right now, but everything that's coming out of this, whether it's content or compassion or connection, there, it only really will land in terms of impact when people start to absorb what's being put out there. And advocacy, and no matter what context you're thinking about it in, whether it's social justice or design or accessibility, it is hard, hard work. And it, the question it's posing to me right now is whether empathy is a prerequisite to compassion. When you want something to land, when you want people to really connect with what you're sharing, there is this, we're all people, right? So obviously we can always relate more deeply to something if we have experienced it ourselves. But I think what we're learning more and more right now in the world is that we don't always have to relate to something to be able to understand it, support it, champion it. So at this scale of the company that um, most of us are at, I think it's, it's fair to say that we can't expect to relate to every single customer in our community. Um, that's really, that's quite impossible, but I think what's required is trust. And we have to trust that the insights, and when I say us, I mean everyone at the company who's like learning from customers, observing, and um, we have to trust that these insights that we're getting are valid and that they're important, that we give them as much weight as we do quantitative data that tech is so famous for, for clinging to as a source of truth, because data is not the only source of truth, perspective, and stories are also a source of truth. Um, so I think what we've done pretty successfully here at Deputy is to normalize the circulation of customer feedback through its many, many channels. We look at feedback from why people leave Deputy, for why they join Deputy, for things that they love about it, for reasons that they're considering leaving us. We're trying to really um, expand all the different avenues that we collect feedback from and, and capture more of those nuances. So we're doing that really well. This information is constantly available to anyone at the company. It may be a little disparate. We're working on streamlining that, but it's there for the people who are interested and are um, passionate about making sure that they're constantly, you know, one ear might have Spotify, but the other ear has got a customer interview playing, right? Like we want to make that more normal. We want people to care very deeply about what people are saying about the product. So I think in terms of the advocacy and what that looks like in the future, it's moving in a direction where we want people to be genuinely curious about customers. We don't want to just have everyone say, what are the trends? You know, what's the latest surge in, in user activity that we should think about? Or where's the latest dip that's taking our profits out? And like, no, we want them to just truly care about, well, what's the latest story that someone went through? What's the latest difficulty that this um, customer had using this feature or just in general, and maybe how's, how is that translating into their product experience? So um, the better we get at that, the better we get at having compassion without requiring empathy, um, I think we'll be able to find more innovative and compassionate ways to use that information in our own work. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, Bianca also mentioned as well, like it's not just at the end or it's not just in this place, it's through the whole process that you have to be thinking about this and bringing in those extra insights, bringing in those extra contextual pieces of information. And it sounds like Divya, like that's your thinking as well. You're like, yes, it's here and it's everywhere and everyone needs to like, you know, be connected to it as much as possible. I'd love to know um, when you're doing the research, when, you, when you're thinking about how do I bring like, like these unique perspectives in, what are kind of the, the defaults that you broke 
to make sure that you were including more people in, in the conversations that you were trying to create? Oh, there's a lot being broken right now. <laughs> um, I think with voice of customer and with deputy specifically, what I'm trying to do is level the playing field. So deputy started in Australia. It is an Australian company and that is still our strongest performing region right now. Um, and this year, as we're very intentionally expanding into the US, one of the most diverse places in the world, there's no better way, I think, to build understanding for this audience, for this community than to show how people work, how they live, how they're leading their lives. Um, so I'll just use this program as an example, clocking with our customers. There are two objectives here. Uh, the first objective for the program is to actually directly connect people who work at Deputy who are building our product with our customers. So if I'm going to a city where we have a hub of customers, I try to strategically align these visits with places where we also have a, you know, even a little hub of deputies who can come along. So it's not just all the perspectives being filtered through me. Like I try to just be neutral. I try to be the beige of translators. So everything that comes through me is just, you know, putting stories together, but I'm trying not to put my bias on anything. But obviously the best way to do that is to just bring people along so they can experience these um, interviews themselves. They can ask questions themselves. They can observe body language and tone shifts. And if someone gets a little nervous, then, you know, what, what is it about them that makes them unique and, you know, learn a little bit more about the business through the lens of this person sitting in front of you. So that's the first objective is break that wall by just putting our, our, our team, our deputy team in front of our customer and vice versa. Um, because our customers also get so much joy out of meeting the people who are building this product and being like, hey, it's not just a bunch of robots trying to, you know, be efficient and get my money and get me to do these things. No, it's like a person who's trying to make my life better. Um, so that kind of has two benefits. The second objective is to um, weave together this narrative. And it, this is a tough one because you want to spotlight individual journeys and the nuance with uh, a single person's perspective. And you also want to show that in a spectrum of perspectives. You want to show multiple perspectives on the exact same issue. And that's going to reveal different ways of thinking, different um, lifestyles, different challenges that they're dealing with, whether it's economic or social. And putting all of this information together, I think, is what makes this customer insights inclusive because you need to see it both on its own and in context with other stories. So I think that's kind of what we're doing right now in terms of uh, making the research inclusive is showcasing a wide range of regions, wide range of people, and also the way that we're sharing that information back because ultimately people need to, as I said, absorb this. And yeah, the more ways that you show people information, the more they're gonna be able to learn it in a way that makes sense for them. Yeah, hundred percent. And to be honest, like the stuff that you create and the videos that you've created and shared back have been some of the best, most like connecting customer interviews I've seen and created. So like, I really feel like I'm there, like, you know, in their business, hearing, hearing their journey. And so uh, it really shows like that, that thought and that like, you know, deliberate, deliberate compassion, even that you want to put into your research shows up in the end product. And, and I think that's like such a great thing that you see um, uh, in other products that are created. Like, I think Mimi, you were saying, you know, the team structure and you know, the team that built the product. And so putting that empathy, that compassion up front shows it the whole way through. Um, I'm just going to pause for two seconds, let everyone know that, the, you know, the Q&A channel is there. Please get your questions in. Uh, we've, we've already answered a couple of them just, uh, just through the conversation. And I've, I've really, really loved the questions coming up. Uh, a, a couple of them in there at the moment are about um, UX writing and, and making sure like the language is inclusive. Uh, does anyone have some stories about like how they're, how they're like reworking the language in their organization and in their products to be more inclusive? I don't have a particular story, but I'll jump in. <laughs> um, we're just being mindful. So there's a few things that have popped up. Um, 
you know, team members have pointed out, hey, we're doing this, but there's no way that people can change this. So like, for example, um, our software creates profiles on can uh, for candidates. Um, and so there's been some conversations recently around like we're using AI to pull in all these, these um, skills and information and, and profiling questions on people. And part of that is gender because our customers want to make sure that they're looking at diversity. So they need all the facts, but that's a sensitive topic. So making sure that we're doing that correctly um, and things like pronouns, you know, have pronouns in, but then they need to be able to change this and update it. So just being mindful in the way that people are using our product and making sure that we can react quickly should something come up um, that is not maybe following best practice or, or like I said earlier, like flexible. Yeah, I love I love this idea. Like you build the product and the person uses the product, and you're like, oh, I'm not sure if that aligns with what we're trying to do with our product. Uh, uh, you know, Nancy Divya Bianca, has that happened as well with the things that you've been creating? We um we do a lot of user testing on language, um, specifically because we live in the banking environment. So there's obviously a lot of constraints around how and and sort of what we can and can't say. But one recently that I can think of is we've been kind of saying pay as normal um, in order to receive your smart receipt in your banking app. And a lot of people in testing were like, well, does that mean with my bank card, my phone, my watch, my ring, whatever else you can pay with? And it was this really, um, it, it's, it's really enlightening sometimes when you think that and I guess this comes back to culture Mim, <laughs> and how we speak internally, you know, you come up with these like different ways of describing, you know, experiences or products or instructions internally. And then you just put that out there and you think that because you as an organization understand exactly what pay as normal means that everybody else will. And I think it's about, I guess, the best way to make sure that your UX writing is really converting is test it. Just put it in front of as many people as possible. Get them to tell you and um, where possible, A, B, test as well. I mean, that's always kind of at our disposal and is a really great way for us to kind of check ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. Two things I'll, oh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to add two things. One, uh, actually, I was thinking about something Nancy said earlier about um, context and how you think about your identity in context. So. Having grown up in a certain community, Nancy, you mentioned, you know, you just felt like this was normal, but as soon as you were taken out of that context, all of a sudden you became a minority. And that's something that is on my mind constantly. And I recently learned this word. So let me back up a minute. I even, there's the phrase DE and I, and Rowan's laughing because he knows I talked to him about this, but the phrase DE and I is something that never really even sits that well with me because it's this great initiative. What it stands for is great. But when you think about the word, diversity, equity, and, and inclusion, even just the word inclusion, it kind of insinuates that the default is not to be inclusive, that there is something that needs to change in order for something, like inclusion needs to happen for it to become diverse, insinuating that the default is not diverse, which is not the case. That's not actually reflecting what is true in the world around us. Um, and there's this word that I learned called ex-nomination, which has blown my mind. And ex-nomination refers to this phenomenon that happens when certain terms are hiding the, I think in the dictionary, it says bourgeoisie, but you can just say the majority if you want. It's hiding the identity of the majority um, without really calling that out. So if you take the word minority even, um, or there are even uh, harsher words that if you wanna take, for example, the word slave and enslaved, that it's a very loaded example, but it's the best one I can use to describe this phenomenon we used for so many years the word slave just everyone unanimously used it but we never thought about who was the one using that term versus now the shift that we're seeing to words like enslaved people which is more representative of the perspectives behind that word and the history behind that word and who it could be impacting so similarly even though I'm not a designer so I'm not directly impacting copy in our in our product and across our marketing experiences and whatnot what I'm trying to do with this program is listen to more of the voices, hear how people describe themselves. So the way we might describe a customer could be completely contrasted by the way that they describe themselves. Um, and, and to Bianca's point, like you, something that we are so certain describes something very clearly, someone else would have no idea what that means. So it's really important for us to step out of our perspective and not take anything for granted, especially when we're using words um, to describe things because everyone brings their own history to that. 
Uh, and I'll just leave with a funny example from uh, the last round of interviews I did. And one of my interview questions for a customer in San Francisco was, uh, how would you describe, or you know, what made you look for work, workplace, uh, workforce management solutions like deputy? And he goes, what's a workforce management solution? <laughs> And that's what I mean. It's like, it's all about perspective. So sometimes it's about simplifying. Sometimes it's just about thinking, what's the opposite end of this? Uh, you know, if I flip my perspective on its head, what, how would I describe the same thing? And that can start to open you up to a different way of thinking. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Like such a such a great uh, topic for you to explain. So thank you so much. And uh, things hiding in other words all the time. And I think, um, uh, I'm sure a lot of people have rolled their eyes at inclusion when it hasn't actually been inclusive. <laughs> and uh, a, a great point here, ben, ben raised a question, like the difference between accessibility and inclusive design and, and how they're not the same thing. How would you go about explaining to uh, you know, people who haven't heard the concepts, the difference between them? I, I have a visual for this. Um, and an example, because it's how my brain registers this. So when you think about accessibility, it's the checks and the, the things that you can practically do. Um, to my point earlier, designing the design systems, accessibility is all about fonts with wide counters so that at a small size, you can understand what the words are, large touch targets so that people can obviously engage. That's accessibility. Accessibility is access to your product, but inclusion and um, when we talk about inclusion by extension, we talk about universal design is when, if you think of inclusion or exclusion, sorry, like a circle, it's kind of bounding around this kind of normal. It bounds around this cohort of people that are average um, and it doesn't include the outliers. And then when we think of inclusion, it's about knocking down that circle altogether and just having a big wide audience of everyone. And an example of where we can see the difference between an accessible design and a more universally inclusive design is um, think of an app that's created for somebody that was born with just one arm. They are able to use it and, and do whatever they need to do on this app with just one arm. And then that also helps that person's friend who just broke their arm and is temporarily unable to use two hands. And then that by extension to Mim's point earlier helps the mom who's got a newborn child and also needs to use one hand. And that's universal design. So the difference between inclusive and universal is how far the product spans, how far the idea supports and, and how many people can really touch, consume and, and appreciate a, a piece of technology, art, whatever it be. It's, it's inclusion in its most broad term. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, anyone else have anything to add to the already fantastic explanation? <laughs> I'm just noting my actually of assent. Um, I love what Bianca just said about how inclusivity can be, can translate so well for different people and different experiences. Um, it's something I think about too, with how there's a fine balance between ensuring that your brand is meeting universal standards, whether that's for inclusivity or accessibility, and also finding ways to support your unique audience's perceived needs and also their direct ask. So the perceived needs is again going back to that example of data where you see charts covering the analytics of like thousands of users and you're like okay these trends are giving me an idea of what their perceived needs might be but then there's also the feedback which is not going to come in at the scale of tens of thousands of data points it's going to be more like 10 or 15 scattered here or there, kind of inconsistent maybe one is an nps comment maybe one is like a phone call transcript or something and it's going to be inconsistent but those direct asks are just as important because they can, again, translate into something that is used across a lot of different um, use cases. So I think in tech companies, oftentimes we're expected to operate super efficiently. Um, and that means that for every change we invest in, there has to have, there has to be as broad of an impact as possible um, just to make it sort of worth that cost. But sometimes accessibility is about making things easier or better. Um, for smaller groups of people. And that can also translate and become better for a lot of people. Even what we consider normal design now, we all had to get used to that at some point. Before we had smartphones, learning how to use a smartphone was not 
easy or user friendly. We all had to learn that for the first time. So I think it's kind of unlearning what we think is normal or universal so we can uh, make things a little bit more approachable for, for a, a large for a set of people. And I think we're doing that really well at Deputy. We, we take in a lot of different types of feedback and we're always bringing it to the forefront of the conversation. So there's engineers talking about feedback, there's designers, like sales folks, there's marketers, everyone's talking about this feedback in different contexts where we're all listening. So there's, there's no feedback that's too small for our consideration. And I think personally, no bias here, but I think the investment in the research function at Deputy is the biggest indicator that something doesn't always have have to have a profit attached to it to be prioritized and to be something that can really change the game. So that's my two cents on that. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I need more sense. If you've got 50 a dollar, a couple hundred dollars, I, I would love to just keep hearing you talk about these things, Divya. So thank you so much. Um, we've, we've had a few questions come through in the chat. Um, some of them about MVP, some of them about startups. Um, how do you ensure that there's like this accessibility, this inclusive thinking when you're getting pummeled with like timeline pressure? And then how do you get people excited about that? Oh, I'll, go. I'll have a go. But I think a lot of it is, um, again, like depending on the type of company you're at and like the context that you're operating within, treat it like, you know, you would with any design project, right? So like, you know, I, I have this goal, how am I going to talk to my users to make this happen? And sometimes you can do a lot, you can put in place like a massive project and do what, um, you know, have put in place like a voice of the customer stream and, and, and go, go all in on that. But sometimes it's just about talking about it a lot. Like anyone who's worked with me, especially at the very early stages, it's just, hey, is this successful? Hey, what are we doing here? And sometimes it's just as small as that and looking for areas that you can make those changes that you're in control of. So sometimes the only accessible thing that, you, you know, thing around inclusivity or accessibility could just be, hey, let's just change the color of this thing to make it. I mean, we as, you know, if we're visual design, like UI designers, or whatever, like we, we, that's something that we're in control of. And even if it's saying, hey, let's make this color contrast accessible and then, you know, explain to people why that's important. Like all those little step changes actually amount to a lot, especially at the startup stage. Maybe you don't have a lot of resources. Um, I guess what I've learned is that no one is actually out there to make things inaccessible. Like at least no one I've talked to has come out and said, no, nah, I just want to not make this easy for someone to use. So that's actually a lot easier to change and like encourage because it's the challenge there is just, okay, how do you promote the value of it? And if you can't do it on a large scale, then, you know, talk about it or just do the tiniest thing that you can. And then you're always then going to be able to find your allies. And then once you have your allies, you can just amplify and then, yeah. Um, yeah. I love that. Like you try and snowball it, right? What are the things that you have control over? I, I'm sure everyone listening can actually go and reflect on that. Like, what do I have control of? What is the 100% thing that I can do and then provide to make that better and then recruit some more people to do that as well? How about uh, Bianca, Mim, any, uh, any tips on moving fast, breaking things, but doing it in a kind way? Yeah, I relate to what Nancy's saying in terms of picking like those small bits because um, I've worked in a few places where there's there's enough time and room to really do like large discovery or to have um, you know research functions going and doing the work at the same time, which is so lovely. But sometimes you're in a startup and you just need to like get something out and quickly iterate and iterate. So it's about working it into your process and making sure that you have those little bits. Um, of snippets coming in to Divya's point like that you've got whether it be NPS or we've got you know full story tracking that you can watch recordings or whether it's sitting in with customer success and making sure that you're working as a company as a whole at knowing your users um, and listening to the feedback or watching recordings of that but also it's about um, like the values of the company so making sure that you bring it back to to people, like people are using our products. They are humans on the other end of this product where it might be, might be sitting there crafting experiences and designs, but it, it's an actual person using it. So making sure that you're bringing it back to that will help sell um, or promote accessibility or inclusive practices 
um, making sure that you're actually coming back to the why. Like, why are we doing this? Yes, this text should be larger or that button should be bigger. It might push out the page, but why? Like, give an example. Fantastic. Like, such good tips and such great tips that I think anyone could pick up and, and try that out and see, see how effective it is and then try something else. So I, I love that. Um, I'm going to ask, we've talked about culture. We've talked about having the right people. I really want to know, like, how are you looking at the design organization um, as, a, as a living organization and changing some of the defaults or changing some of the things to make sure that you're attracting and keeping, you know, a, like a wide variety of people from a lot of different backgrounds. Um, I'd love to hear from Nancy just about your experiences of, of building a team um, first, yeah. Yeah, um, I think um, partnering real hard with um, your people and talent team is like one that I've learned like so much. And, you know, I think a lot of people are really lucky where their people and talent team are, are already thinking and looking about uh, looking into that. And when you have that kind of set up, it's, it's really good because a lot of a lot of it then is around, okay, checking your biases, people who are already, who have training in those areas, they're a lot more prone to be able to pick up, okay, what the biases are. So constantly I'm going to my, you know, my head of people and be like, hey, um, you know, this is what I feel about this person. Like, um, can you please tell me if there's anything that I'm thinking here that is actually, you know, um, yeah. Um, biased or, or, or yeah or not not great kind of thing um, but also think um, assessing um, like thinking about what you're hiring for so like if you're hiring for like looking at those skills but what are those skills that are actually integral that you actually need versus like things that you can train and like I think Tibia was saying before like how do we even that playing field a little bit so yeah maybe someone doesn't have like all of these skills however they bring a diversity uh, of thought or opinion or, or um, background and so do we really need them to have all of those skills um, or is it something that we can train because we're prioritizing what they bring that isn't like, you know, the hard skills. So for example, you know, employing maybe like younger people who, who don't have as much work experience. However, they bring the, you know, um, they bring with them, you know, like you have a workforce that's, you know, have a certain level of maturity, but you bring, bring in someone who's a bit more younger, a bit more inexperienced. However, they bring that slightly different view of the world. I can train you on, on other things. The company can train you on other things. So that's kind of how I see it. Yeah, beautiful. I, I love that framing as well. Something that I, I heard that was really important was getting another perspective from someone else. Like, you know, not just being in your own head, partnering with someone with a lot of experience and bouncing that ideas back and forth. Seems like that's a great way for you who's aware that there are biases to like have a conversation with someone and say, are these biases coming out? So I, I really love that. Um, I, I love also that this dovetails into MIM, which I'm going to ask you, Rejig actually wants to stop these biases and these these um, very subjective ways of assessing uh, people for whether they're going to be right or wrong for for an opportunity um, by having like a, a strong framework and and the AI engine to to help point you in the direction of people with excellent skills. And I'd love to know like how you using that or leveraging that in your thought about the like design team that you've built? Yeah, I love this topic because it's really my my whole world at the moment. Like when we talk about when we're researching and knowing our users, this is what I'm learning. Um, so I love that Nancy's talking a lot about skills because um, the whole point of our product is like looking at skills. So that might not be, and not at somebody's experience or their title or anything like that. It's coming back to skills. So again, treating them as people. Um, and that could be on a range of things. So if you start to then look at people who have been on parental leave for a period of time, you're not judging them based off that. Um, they might have learned other skills off something else they've done or a course they've done. Or you might be in a job that is on one side of the company, um, but actually you've done a few courses and your skills relate and you'd be completely suitable for a complete transition to the other side of the company. So what Rejig does is its intelligence engine is actually suggesting people based on their skill set um, not previous experience and all these other biases. So the way we kind of approach that is uh, we're really serious about our ethics. So our AI engine is the first in world um, 
accredited audited ethical AI um, engine, which is super exciting and super proud of the team. Um, and when you listen to our chief data officer talk about this and talk about neutralizing all the biases and the amount of biases um, and the data points that they're looking at and making sure that they're neutralizing here so that the recommendations are ethical, um, it's, it's just absolutely incredible. So how we do that for our team is really interesting and it makes sure that it's really front of mind um, because it's the conversation that we're having everywhere. So making sure that um, you're conscious of your bias, of these biases. And again, um, someone said it earlier, but just like pointing it out. So having really open conversations, making sure that our short lists are, have a certain level of diversity in it, which is what Rubrik does as well. Like, so we're giving intelligence um, and data on, on your short lists. So looking at the people who you're actually speaking to, but then also making sure that your panel who's interviewing is also diverse so that you've got diverse um, opinions coming back from these hires, yeah. It really sounds like it's a whole whole of system kind of approach to like, where can I intervene and where can I make that change and then assessing, did it have the impact that I wanted? Um, over to you, Bianca. Sorry, I just have, like, I think it's so great all the work we do to hire diversely, but someone brought this to my attention the other day and it's just, it's just something so awesome to, to start thinking about as well. But it's like, once we hire diversely, doing all the things that Nancy and Mim just spoke to, what are we doing at the other side to support them when they start? Let's say we're trying to get more women. Are we making space for them in the meetings? Let's say we're hiring people that speak English as a second language. Are we communicating to them and assuming they'll understand? Or are we actually you know, making sure we're considerate of them? Maybe we hire religious diversity. Is the office equipped with prayer rooms to support rituals. I think it's twofold. I think it's everything the girls said about bringing them in and, and how we do it. And then the other side of it is let's support them when they're actually in. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for, for bringing that point. Cause I think that's, that's also great. Like getting them in the door, but also how do you keep them? Um, and actually on that point, do you have any tips about how you're, you're trying to make sure that that culture extends into uh, like the design culture and how you work with people throughout the organization. I guess that slip specifically, when we speak about a design culture, it is the whole company. Like we don't have silos. We're not a design team that is exclusive. Um, when we design, you'll often find at slip blended teams designing. We'll do design sprints where from the start, we've got the founders in the room, the office experience managers, we've got the engineers and great ideas can come from anywhere. And so for us, our design culture is everyone. Um, and so I don't have anything specific to say around how we really um, harness that because it's just very open. Yeah, we're the same. It's about making sure that everyone's included really early. Like if you're doing the ideation session, it's so important that you have people from everywhere, um, you know, inputting there. Um, another thing we do is we're conscious making sure that people from all around the company come in to um, make any decisions. So for example, we're moving to like work anywhere model um, and they have it put together a team to make sure that there's insight coming from everywhere and that we're being conscious that we're global. So we're across lots of different time zones. So what does that look like for meetings? When's a good time to put meetings um, and making sure that we have as much information as possible. And always like, you know, forms, everyone loves a good survey, but, you know, making sure that there's actually streams for people to feedback um, and help build and evolve that culture of care and, and inclusion. I think there's also an element of like thinking about like what the edge cases are or what the stress cases are when in the approach to that. So for like a really simple example would be, okay, we're in a hybrid work environment. So like let's cater to um, people who are remote. Let's make sure that the meetings in a remote environment works well because the main, maybe the mainstream or the, the non-edge case, the happy path is people being in offices. And, and that's something that we're trying right now to think about, okay, if we cater to the edge cases, surely it, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Hey, thank you all so much. An hour is just not enough time because I could sit here and ask you questions all day and just bask in kind of like the information that you're sharing so thank you all so much I, I, i'm really keen just just to wrap up um I, i'd love to hear what's an intentional thing that you're going to be doing 
uh, after after this panel in the future to make make your work more inclusive. And I'd love to start with Bianca. Um, I think my focus moving forward is to make sure that um, representation is considered at a business level. I think um, if we can make sure that, you know, and we do, and so it's just really harnessing this, making sure that, you know, from the founders down, we're really making sure that it's a metric or an, an important topic that's considered as much as conversion or revenue. Like this is as important, it needs to be from the business level down and it's everyone's responsibility. Fantastic. And uh, Mim? I think continuing to widen my horizons. I haven't made much time for that recently. And this has really brought that passion back. So, um, you know, making sure that I continue to have like a growth mindset and I might go and grab some books or find some new podcasts. So if anyone has anything to recommend, um, just, you know, keep learning, keep it alive. Beautiful. Divya? Uh, I think it's a two-pronged approach for me. So from conducting research, my uh, the changes that I want to make are becoming more of a conversationalist with interviews. I think there is a fine balance between making sure you're getting the information that you need to do the work you're doing. But I think just making it more conversational is going to put everyone at ease and it's going to let a lot more interesting stuff slip out too. So that's one element of it. And then the other side is really getting people excited about the the insight so after we do the interviews and bring them back to deputy just really getting people excited about hearing the perspectives and and curious i want people to start it's not just the company's strategy that's informing this research i also want it to be the, the everyone who's building the product i want them to also influence how the research is being done the kinds of questions we're asking um just to make everyone you know get more involved and, and feel like this is everyone's project so that's that's what i'm going to be doing next I'm very excited about that. Uh, Nancy? Um, yeah, so we're very much at the building stage. So I'm really going to take everything that I learned here and try and put it in place and make it part of like foundationally what we do so that I guess we've talked about this, but make it sort of normalize it so that hey, accessibility, inclusion, all of that isn't really talked about as a separate thing. It's just a thing that we do. Amazing. Thank you all again so much. Thank you so much to everyone who joined in to the conversation today to listen to our amazing panelists. So again, thank you, Mim. Thank you, Nancy, Divya and Bianca. I, I really appreciate all of the information and, and insight and experiences you shared. And I'm, I'm certain people are going to be like, amazing. Let's get back to work and let's start making things more inclusive. Um, tomorrow is our last day of shifting design. You can go sign up for the panels. Uh, they're going to be big panels, so I would really recommend going. It's on shifting.design. Uh, the first one's 12 to 1 p.m. and it's moving into management, and that is in partnership with ADP List, which, uh, as I'm finding out, literally everyone is like, I love ADP List. I'm always on it. That's how I met half the people. Uh, so, I, that's going to be amazing. Um, our very own Jackson Taylor is going to be hosting Mitch Clements, Tara Kelly and Millie Schmidt uh, about how to move into management from, from product design. Uh, and then our final panel for shifting design, uh, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m., scaling impactful design teams. Again, huge, like you're going to hear about culture. You're going to hear about where it breaks. You're going to hear about how to, how to get the duct tape out and how to keep it moving and, and producing how it needs to be. And that is being hosted by our very own senior design director, um, Lizzie Shappy, who is also the driver behind Shifting Design. And we'll be hearing from Danef Mappa, Crystalline de Messer, Sammy Sloan, and Tim Yo. So thank you all again. I really hope to see you all. I've seen so many of you from the last couple of days um, and it's just been so great. So again, thank you all so much and uh, good luck into the future and I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>